Stand to your feet this morning, and uh, it's so good. Uh, we've been we've been blessed with the word uh, beatitudes for the last five weeks, coming six, something like that, and weeks. Yeah, it's good. And uh, I know I'm excited to hear what Pastor Terry is going to bring to us. Uh, the last last weeks, um, Pastor, it's changing my life. The beatitudes, Matthew five. And uh, I hope it has with you too. So uh, we're going to honor our pastor this morning. We're going to honor our pastor. That's just Josh. We'll be back there. And uh, let's let's give him a hand. Let's honor him by listening this morning, listening to what God has put on his heart, and uh, let it change our lives. I just leave this one on. Well, there's something wrong with mine, so I'll pull it off anyway. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to come together in the name of Jesus. And uh, Father, we just we just love you. Um, you're so amazing. You're so faithful and so precious and uh, so committed to us, Lord. I pray that we could have the same commitment towards you as you have towards us. And as we learn this, these lessons in life, I pray that that will develop and grow to be the reality of the people of God upon the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Um, just welcome everybody here today. It's been, uh, it's been a great week again. The weather's been amazing. Amen. I hope nobody's complaining about the weather this week. By the end of this message, you might not like me if you have been. So, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's good. I really felt uh, um, in worship, I, I felt that there was a few people struggling. And I know Larray has been struggling with headaches lately. And uh, like major headaches. Is there any, I thought there was a couple other people that were struggling with that kind of pain. Is anybody here? Uh, Rhonda? Anybody else? I felt there was like three people for sure with 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 uh, Larray. Is it, there's got there's one more for sure. Oh, oh, Richard! Oh, Richard! Okay, there. That's right too. Yeah, he had a he had a, got clubbed in the head and he's having after effects of that. Yeah, I forgot about you, Richard. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not that I don't love you. It's just I forgot about you. But those, so those three. Let's pray for those people right now. Just gather around them and uh, let's take care of those headaches. Get rid of them. Because Jesus is the healer, and I just felt it strong, just real strong. Just take authority over those headaches, and um, that the Lord will just remove that pain instantly in the name of Jesus. The reoccurrences would not come back. We want to we talk like that in that realm. Just release the presence of God upon them in the name of Jesus. This is good. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. That's good. Amen. Good. I like I like when we can do that together. Um, it's, it's not necessarily one man or one woman has to pray for you, but the body of Christ can pray for you, and I think that's really powerful. It's really effect, affecting. So, uh, just if you get some, uh, if you have a testimony that the Lord touched you, you got to make sure you share that because that's part of the sustaining um, of the healing in Jesus' name. Um, my my iPad this morning was just about. I was just really had about about had a a tirade over my. I was watch, looking at my notes and all of a sudden everything disappeared. And like everything, like all my notes from all my messages, everything was gone. So, so I was just about. I'm not a big Apple fan at all, really. So I was just about really about lost it completely. And but I found them in the cloud. 
What is with that? <laughs> you alpha people. Like, what is that all about? Like, it's, it had to be a revelation of the Holy Spirit to, for me, because I'm not a techno guy at all. I just went through settings and I looked and I found them in the cloud. <laughs> wow. Just testing me, testing me. I was like really, really, really upset for a moment, but I had my everything typed out, but I just, I like to have things my way. But anyway, make sure you come to this tonight. Don't miss this. This is going to be awesome. Uh, Prairie Fire Unite worship event. There's, there's at least 90 people coming from Saskatoon, and we're packing lunches. Did you want to say anything about, oh yeah, you probably want to, yeah. <laughs> we're very unorganized. But. <laughs> No, we're not. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, the cloud. Anyway, Terry got a new iPod. That's why all this stuff went to the cloud. Anyway, so on that note. Um, what to do with this? Lots. Anyway. Um, oops. Okay. Uh, so we're going to make 90 lunches at 5 o'clock this afternoon. Um, 100, sorry. Uh, so we just need a few people. Um... Uh, Carol White, are you going to be here to Marsha? Are you staying around? You're going back? Okay. So Carol White, you're still here. And Paulette, and Bev, and me. Who? Oh, yes, yes, Jackie, yes, and Rhonda. Okay, five, five shall do good because we'll, it's just an assembly line. So, okay, so come on out at seven. Make sure you're here earlier because you might not get a seat. Yeah, we're going to set up more seats too, but don't make that an excuse. Oh, I couldn't find a seat, so I'm not coming. Okay, so don't do that. Just come. Enjoy it. There's going to be testimonies tonight of, uh, you know, our, the, really what I want to do is introduce you to all my friends that are coming tonight. So that's the friends that we've accumulated over the years with being a part of Prairie Fire. And uh, it's nice to get out of our own circle. I'm a real believer of that, not just to become clicky and don't hang around with any other believers uh, so that's why we do it and that's why we have a vision for the province of Saskatchewan and actually for our nation for the fire of God to spread throughout the whole nation uh, so there'll be testimonies on what why we do what we do and uh, that's good amen uh, so uh, I'm on part six of, of uh, my, my series on how to succeed in life and and really, that's it's quite a it's a statement, and and we always we always want how many want to be successful in this place? You know, seriously, be honest about it. Everybody wants to succeed, but the definition of success is is really is is really what we're trying to figure out. And it's this is a success being connected being connected to the power and the presence of God. Um, okay, do I have the quote of the day up? And I, I just wanted to to. To put that up there a little bit, I really, this, Shelley sent me this week. I don't know who Tim Keller is, but the, the sin that is most destructive in your life right now is the one you are most defensive about. <laughs> and uh, that is so true. You know, you, if we if we hit a hit a nail on the head or something, or if we're talking to somebody and all of a sudden they just start getting really defensive about something, it means that there's a struggle going on, and that's that's no problem. It can be overcome. I remember several years ago, well, actually it wasn't that long ago, I, I uh, bought some inspirational television watching and uh, the Beverly Hillbillies. Um, <laughs> some of you younger people probably don't even know what the Beverly Hillbillies are, but I was watching this show and, and, and it was the first, I think it was the very first one, and they had, or maybe it was the second, they had struck oil on Jed's land and and they became instant millionaires, uh, and it was it was quite a quite a story, as you know. And so they decided to pack up and to move to Beverly Hill, uh, Beverly Hills. And before they were going, they were talking about uh, Beverly Hills, what it was all about. Like they they were they were chatting away. Granny was there, Jed was there, and and Jethro and Ellie Mae, and they're all talking and saying, you know, they're. There's no snow up there. And they said, yeah, that's, that's going to be good. Because remember when Granny, she fell on the ice and she broke her hip? And they, Jed says, yeah, that was bad. She never walked for a whole three days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so then they're talking and they're wondering, why is there no snow? Why is there no snow? And, the, and they all, well, I don't know. Let's ask Jethro. He's the educated one. And so they asked Jethro. 
They asked Jethro, well, how come there's no snow in Beverly Hills? And he goes, don't look at me. I never took it. <laughs> right away, he was in the defensive mode. And sometimes when we hear the word of God, we get very defensive, saying, what does he know about me? Like, how come he's preaching at me? I'm not preached at you. I don't know what you do, and I don't really care. But if there's one that does care, his name is Jesus the Holy Spirit, he, 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 he cares. God cares. And he cares enough to bring it to light. Um, I was doing some work outside here a couple of days ago. And the Lord started just to speak to me about some the simplicity. Wanting not me to simplify my life. And wanting me to teach people to simplify their lives. And, and um, a lot of the teaching that I've heard over the years is... Um, it's, there's been a lot of good stuff, but there's been a lot of stuff that's just kind of a little hazy. And, you know, one of the things is that Jesus died so we can go to heaven. And that's true and everything, but that's, that's not why he came. Just so that we can go to a place after we're done here on earth. And the Lord just started speaking to me, and he, he just says, we put too much emphasis on the place and not enough emphasis on the relationship. The relationship that God wants, God wants restored. Um, and so there's this whole emphasis on the place. If you died today, do you know for sure if you would go to heaven? How many, time, how many people have heard that? A million times. But what about if it was like this? If you died today, would, do you know for sure if you would stand before Jesus? Because that's what it's all about. It's not about the place. We put too much emphasis on the place. And the same thing has happened in the church. You know, in the major emphasis has been on a place rather than on relationship. Jesus died on the cross so that relationship with God could be restored. That's the whole deal. I, you know, I, 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 I'm thinking about it. You know, in heaven, what's the focal point? It's Jesus. It's, it's not the gold streets and all, the, all that stuff. And that's going to be nice and all that. But if Jesus isn't there, it's meaningless. When we heard the, um, Jake Veach from Bethel when he spoke here, he talked about how Jesus is in everything. He's in everything. He holds everything together. He holds everything together. Everything on earth is held together by Jesus. Your house is held together by Jesus. This building is held together by Jesus. But also heaven is held together by Jesus. So if Jesus isn't in heaven, it's not going to be, it's, it's not going to be, it's not sustainable. It can't be held together. And so the, when you look at the beauty, um, the beauty in heaven it all originated with Jesus, right? The beauty on earth, it all originated in, in, with Jesus. He, can, he created everything. Jesus is the one who created everything, as the word says. But when you're not connected with Jesus, you will either, there's two things that happen. You won't recognize the beauty of creation, and that's where I was most of my life. 29 years, I didn't see a beautiful thing on earth. I could care less. Was, oh, nice. And, 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 but once I come into a relationship, my relationship with God was restored. His creation just became so incredibly beautiful. It just astounded me. All of a sudden, even, even clouds started looking good. You know, <laughs> amazing how every cloud, there's uniqueness in everything. And so, you when you're not connected with Jesus, you don't recognize the beauty. Or the other thing that can happen is that you begin to worship creation. If you're not connected with Jesus. There's two things that can happen. The one is you don't recognize the beauty. And the other thing is that, that, um, that oh, I lost my, I lost my brain here for a second. Yeah, we worship creation. We begin to worship creation. The beauty of creation. We see creation as beauty and we worship creation, but we don't worship the creator and then all this mess starts to happen. So heaven and earth without Jesus cannot be sustained. And when a relationship with the Lord is restored, 
our personal relationship with the Lord is restored, our other relationships begin to fall into place. They start being restored. Although some of those relationships that are being restored with your family or your friends or whatever might take years and years and years to be restored. But the thing that happened, the, the, the thing that happens is it's a beginning point. You begin to say, now there's hope for my relationship. There's hope for my relationships to be restored because my relationship with the Father is restored. Not because of anything I did, but because of the work of the cross. The work of the cross, the, the connection, we, we just connect, we just submit to the authority. We fall into the plan of God when we submit to His ways and His will. Amen? And so... Um, It can never be about a place. It will never, it'll never be sustained. Relationship with God will never be sustained if all you're thinking about is looking forward to going to heaven. It'll be a flat relationship waiting for a future event to happen. It has to be about Jesus. If we tell people something like this, if we tell people that... Um, Anything less than that, we're deceiving them. It's all about relationship restored. If we tell them that it's just about a prayer, you just say this prayer and everything's okay, it's, you're deceiving them. We're deceiving them. It's more, it starts with a prayer, but that's not what finishes it. it it's the beginning of the renewing of the mind. And, and we have to re, really put an effort to renew our mind, especially in our culture, because we've got these things you know, and iPads that go into the clouds and stuff like that. We've got all this stuff. We've got television. We've got all this stuff. There's so much stuff. And it, it, we have to, there's a renewing of the mind that must take place. There's a transformation. The only way transformation takes place is a renewing of the mind. It's a battle of the mind. It's a battle in the mind that we have to win. That's the most incredible battle there is on the earth, really. You know, we we like to, uh, this iPad is really giving me some grief today. What's wrong with you? Get out of here. I'm going to check it right away. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, it's a good thing I have my Blackberry. Because I have it on there. But it's always got to have a backup with these things, right? And so it's a good thing I emailed myself. <laughs> and then the only problem is I got 14,000 emails to go through. Be patient with me. See, this is how you lose focus. <laughs> you depend on technology, right? Amen? I'm teaching you right now. Okay, where are you? Sometimes, you know, you get about 18 million emails. I can't believe this. Where are you? Where art thou? Well, there we go. There. No, Samsung's are the same evil. Yeah. Now it's got to load. But anyway, so this whole thing about relationship being restored with God is the key and that it's the beginning of the transformation of the mind and um, this is really something here no I'm, I'm good now I got it on my Blackberry everybody say Blackberry <laughs> oh my goodness I'm not always this way for anybody who's our guest today. I'm not always this way. I'm actually worse. So, but anyway, how to succeed in life, part six. And, and we've been talking about that for six weeks. And this is our sixth week. It started months ago. But I've had so many guest preachers and stuff that it's going to take me. I should be done by 2018 uh, with, this, with this series. But we're talking about how to succeed in life and how to succeed in life. Number one, our relationship with God must be restored, period. And the work is already done. All we got to do is walk into it. We got to say, come into a relationship with God. We give our lives to him. We say, okay, Lord, we're ready. I'm ready to submit to your ways. 
And that's about all we know when we come into it. At least me. That's me. That's all I knew. I said, okay, Lord, I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do, whatever that might be. And he heard me. He said, he, when I said, I'll do anything you want me to do, he heard me. And today I'm standing in front of you, um, being like confused and unorientated. And like, I'm just, I have problems today. And I'm here because Jesus sent me here. So you have to talk to him if you don't like it. Okay. So God blesses those who are, are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And this is all, it's all about the Beatitudes. I've been talking about the Beatitudes for the last, you know, this is six, part six. So, and I'm convinced, I'm more and more convinced, the more I study it, this is a progressional development in our relationship with God. And so once we're connected with God, once we realize our need for him, then we step into the reality of who he is, and he blesses those who, who mourn. In our time of mourning, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they, um, for they will inherit the whole earth. And God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And today we're going to talk about... God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Wow, that's quite a statement right there, isn't it? Oh, God blesses those who are, whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. And this whole thing about progressional, and, and you know, and until we really realize our need for God, like every one of us, I'm, I'm really beginning to, every day I'm getting older and 23 years or however long I've been serving the Lord and I lost track but not that long but every day I'm realizing that my need for him is more significant every day you, you would think the more mature you get with the things of God the, the less you would need him but the more you get to know him the more you need him and why people struggle in relationship with God is because they get to the real, they, they, we have this independent spirit and we think, well, I know I'm good enough. No, that's enough. And then all of a sudden we're in trouble. We get into trouble big time because we think, well, I know enough about God right now. I, I got everything I need. I don't need to listen to those guys from Faith Alive. I don't need to listen to anybody from Regina Ab. I don't need to listen to Pastor Rick from Regina Ab or anybody else. I don't need to because I got enough. And that's when we start getting in trouble. We start, our relationship with God starts to wane because relationship with God, if it's good, it, it, it flows out of you into your relationships with people. And if you're struggling with your relationship with people, it just means you need more of God. You need to understand, the re, realize that we need more of Him. Until we realize a need for the Lord in everything that we do. You know, these eight attitudes of the heart will never take root. These are eight specific hearts of, or attitudes of the heart that draw the presence of God. It, draw, it draws the presence of God. It's a, it's a fascinating thing. There's certain things that draw the Lord. And that this, is, this is attitudes of the heart. You know, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Here's what we have to understand, though, that none of us are born with a pure heart. Because the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and you want, you know, I, I remember talking to a nurse up in northern Saskatchewan about the things of God. And she said, you know, kids are born perfect. <laughs> I said, really? Um, did you have to treat, teach your kids how to be bad? Well, no. Well, where did that come from? It comes naturally. Was anybody ever a child in here at one time? Did, did you ever do anything wrong? If you haven't, you're probably in the wrong place. You don't want to listen to me. But there's this thing. It's about our hearts are, there's a problem with our hearts. We're broken. There's things in us that are broken. And the work of the cross brought restoration to that brokenness. And so praise the Lord for that. So what does it mean to be pure in heart? It means to have a heart of integrity. And as I said before, nobody's born with this. And 
The only reason that we have a heart of integrity is through our relationship with God. Amen. We can't, none of us are going to brag and say, I got such a pure heart. You know, actually, the, the more pure your heart becomes, the less pure you begin to feel. It's because you're just, you get drawn closer to God. And the closer you get to God, you find, oh man, I got a ways to go. How many feel that way? I've got a ways to go. Yeah. Some of you do, the rest of your life. But anyway, <laughs> we, got a, we, got, we got a way to go. And in our culture, in our culture, the, we're more concerned with our image more concerned with our image rather than our character. What do we look like? We're more concerned. What's it going to look like in front of people? You know, sometimes the Lord requires us to look like a fool. Steve Hill used to say, "If you got to be willing to look like a fool to be in in, in the in the in the sight of your peers, in order to be embraced in the arms of Jesus." And that's so true. That's a that's a true statement. You know. And so, in First Samuel, chapter 16, verse 7, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, don't judge, this, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not see the things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, the Lord is more in, interested in the direction of your heart rather than the appearance of your whatever you you want to look good I'm, i i want to be i want to make sure that i look good in front of people but he's more pure, he's more impressed with the direction of your heart and I, I have to say direction of the heart because none of us are perfect and he's never he's never going to be because of the 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 absolute purity of the heart till jesus returns and and then we when the perfect comes then we become perfect right but this whole life process, the, the march towards a, a heart of purity is a process. How many know that? It's, it's, a, it's a march towards purity. It's a process. It, it, it goes on and on and on and on. And if you're not connected with Jesus and you're trying to do this on your own, it can become very frustrating. But when you're connected with Jesus, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. I blew two opportunities to pray, pray for people this week. Like, and it used to bug me so much that I didn't do it and, and until one day the Lord says at least you're thinking about it now you know I had the perfect opportunity to pray for people one with a bad leg and, and then there, uh, there was this other time in, in Staples I was at Staples the other day and, and I, I went in and I was looking for one of these eye things that make me mad <laughs> and um, I'm talking to this guy and and he had to go ask the supervisor a question. When he went to ask the supervisor his question, this one girl looks at, looks at him and says, oh, here comes the guy with a million questions. And they just start laughing at him, like hysterically. They're laughing at him and making fun of him. And this guy's asking a question because he wants to be, he wants to make sure the customer gets the right product. And so I was just like, I can't believe these guys are laughing at him. And, but he, here's the bad, the worst part of it all. I walked out of there without saying anything to them. I could have walked up to the guy and said, listen, you don't need to listen to that. God, you know, God loves you. He's got a plan for your life. And I, and I should have went up to them and said, you know, the way you treated them was very disrespectful. So that's two things I failed at in one day. But the Lord is merciful. At least I thought about I, I began When I walked out of there, because I'd never been in that situation before. I, I never realized. I never, it, it just didn't ever mean anything to me. But it's this road to the, trying to get a purified heart, you know, that you begin to see things that you've never seen before because you're open to the heart of God. So this whole process and, and the march towards the heart of purity. I wrote this down. The march towards the heart of purity is a process. And in learning about purity, we make a lot of mistakes. Amen. <laughs> and, and Noah, you think about Noah. When you hear these names of Noah, Abraham, David, Moses, Paul, all of them were men with, that the Lord would consider had pure hearts. They were men of integrity, but none of them were perfect. Noah, for example, he got drunk. 
Abraham, he tried to help the Lord speed up a process for him to get, for God to speed up the process of having a child, a son. David was an adulterer, and then he even, in the, after the, he committed adultery, he had the Bathsheba's husband killed. Moses had a temper. And Paul, who was Saul at one time, was an enemy, enemy of the church, and he became one of the most important leaders in the history of the church. So it's not where you start, it's where you end that matters, right? And, the pro, and these guys were dependent on the Lord. And living a life of integrity doesn't mean that you're going to be sinless. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that you will not make any mistakes. The road to purification is a road littered with mistakes. You can write that down. The road to purification is a road that's littered with mistakes. And it's through the mistakes that we learn about purity, the purity of God. And we come um, to this one conclusion on the road to purity. There's one conclusion that we come up with, come up with guaranteed 100% of the time. You'll find it. You'll study it. You'll go through it. You'll find out the, on the road to purity, you'll find out one thing. You are not God. We are not God. And there's only one source of purity, and that flows from the throne. And it flows into our life through Jesus Christ. Amen? So God blesses the, those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. So what does it mean, seeing God? It means being in His presence. It means experiencing God's power. It means experiencing God's purpose in your life. It means um, the peace of having the peace of God in your life. How many have the peace of God and love the peace of God? I love the peace of God. I love the peace of God. Sometimes I lose it once in a while. I lose it. And I, get, I start getting anxious and fearful and everything. And then I, I just begin to meditate on God and meditate on his word. And then the peace comes back. We experience the pardon of God. Being blessed, being, uh, having a pure heart means that you're experiencing the pardon of God. You're experiencing the friendship of God. We begin to see God in every area of our lives. There's three words that define a man or a woman of integrity or people with whole hearts and one of them the first word is wholeness you become part and when I think think of that not that we become whole but we become part of the whole family of God you cannot find out about the love of God the depth or the height or the width or the length of God's love on your own it has to be done within the context of community it's in the context of the body of Jesus Christ and and so and it's being a whole, part of the whole family. Not a person of segregation. You are, and you are the same no matter where you go, whoever you're around. Number two is, the second word, first word was wholeness. The second one is authenticity. Acting the same no matter where you are and no matter who you're around. Authenticity. God, I always tell people that God gave you your personality. He doesn't want your personality to change. He just wants our character to change. And the only way our character can change is if we're connected to Jesus. And once then he intertwines his character with our personality. And we're all, authentic. we're all authentic. We're all a little different. We're all a little unique. And that's a good thing. And, and, and we can't judge somebody because they're a little bit unique but that authenticity is is really important to defining a pure heart a person with a pure heart and number three is sincere and that with unmixed motivation doing the right things for the right reasons and and what are you doing when nobody's looking that's an important thing that sincerity is really that the most important Part of important part about being sincere is what you do when nobody's looking. Nobody's looking. So that's sincerity. So wholeness, authenticity, and being sincere. And so we, on earth, being people, we do things because we want to have a good reputation. But God is more inter interested in our character. We are more interested in image, and God is in interested more in integrity. Proverbs chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 21 and 22, out of the message, says this, Dear friend, 
Guard clear thinking and common sense with your life. Don't for a minute lose sight of them. They keep your soul alive and well, and they'll keep you fit and attractive. There's a good workout plan right there. Did you read that? That's a good one. And clear thinking and common sense will lead you to being fit and attractive. <laughs> That's good. Because really, if God is in you, there's, a, there's an attractiveness to you. You're drawn. People are drawn not to your looks. They're drawn to the presence of God. Amen? So this is good. So the blessings, there's several blessings that are brought about by integrity or by having a pure heart. And one of the blessings is personal confidence. And you have confidence, not in so much in yourself, but it shows in your personality because your confidence is in God. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 9 says, People with integrity walk safely, but those who follow crooked paths will be exposed. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 3 says, The integrity of the honest keeps them on track. The deviousness of crooks brings them to ruin. So part of the people, they, we have a lack of energy is because we put so much energy into putting on a front, trying to make things look good, but on the inside life is turbulent. Amen? And so that's one of those blessings that's brought around by, by living a life of purity. Number two, you'll have a lasting legacy. The one in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7, it says, the one who lives with integrity is righteous. His children who come after him will be happy. Uh, amen? And so, I sometimes I... I, I you know, condemnation and stuff like that will gather on you and think of, you start thinking about all the mistakes you made in life. But I found out something a long time ago that our story isn't over yet. <laughs> the thing about God is His mercifulness. And we talked about mercy before and what mercy, what, what mercy means and what it's all about is the Lord is merciful. And our stories are not over yet. And we can change. The good news is we can change. Say, I can change. It doesn't matter who you are, how old you are. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. Is that we can change. And that's the good news of, of, of the gospel. And it's about change. In um, Job chapter 8, verse 5 and 7, in the New Living Translation, it says, But if you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, and if you are pure and live with integrity, He will surely rise up and restore your happy home. And though you started with little, you will end with much. That's a good word right there. I, I love that. That's really, especially that, though you started with little, you will end with much. We got to understand that. That's a good, that's a really powerful word of God right there. And other blessings that are brought, brought on by integrity are blessings of eternal rewards. That's really good news. This is an, this is an eternal thing that we're, we're building on we might not see a whole lot of rewards in our life but there you know that we don't see the end result of it but there's this thing that happens that when we get connected to an eternal being we are in we are become eternal beings i don't know about you but i'm eternal how about you and and it's not because of anything that we've done good it's because of the work of the cross once again relationship restored through jesus christ it's powerful and it's wonderful. Um, Matthew 25, verse 21 in New Century or vision, or Version says, The master answered, You did well. You are good and loyal servants because you were loyal with small things. I will let you care for much greater things. Come and share my joy. The Lord wants to share his joy with us for eternity. Psalm chapter 15 talks about purity. And who can enter into the presence of God? Psalm 15, 1 to 5, it says, Who may worship in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? Those, and then it tells us, those who lead blameless lives, 
do what is right, speaking the truth from sincere hearts. Those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. Those who despite flagrant sinners and despise uh, flagrant sinners and honor the faithful followers of the Lord and keep their promises even when it hurts. Those who lend money without charging interest and who cannot be bribed to lie about the innocent. Such people will stand firm forever. So that's, we're talking about this is how to get close to God. This is about developing a purity heart. Purity heart. There's eight characteristics of a person with a heart of integrity. There's eight characteristics that are being developed in all of us. As I mentioned before, we're all in process. Nobody's arrived yet. But those eight characteristics are people. Number one, people who tell the truth. Number two, people who refuse to slander. Number three, people who won't listen to gossip. People who won't speak evil of friends. A person who honors others. A person who keeps his promises. A person who is generous. And a person who cannot be bribed. Good word right there. That's the development of purity in our life. There, there has to be something measure, to be measured, to measure by. There has to be. The word of God is something that we can measure. This is what we're doing in our life. Is there? And when we look at this and we see, oh man, people who, don't, who refuse to listen to gossip, well, I just gossiped yesterday. What am I supposed to do about that? Ask for forgiveness. Ask for forgiveness, you know, and speaking evil of friends and all these things. We look at all this stuff. Man, I've done every one of those. But how do we stop it? How, how can we stop it? It's by having that relationship with the Father, and we just look to Him, and we say, Lord, please help me. Change me. Fill me with Your presence. Get into the Word of God. Study the Word of God and see what's required of Him, what He requires, not what... Like, my standards are so much lower than God's standards. But when I look at His standards and... And he tells, he writes them down in the word. And he, he, the reason he writes them in the word is because I think that he says, he's thinking it's possible for us to become this. Right? It's possible to become this process. Again, being in the process. And a person that gets good at this is a person who's very secure. You're not worried about anything. You want to quit worrying? Just learn about the purity process. Begin to, begin to become that purity that God talks about. And the only way we, be, we become purity is because we're connected with the king. And there's six ways to develop purity. How many want to hear this right now? I've got about 15 minutes. Six, six ways to develop. Anybody want to, want to learn a little bit more? Okay, there's three or four or five. But I know you all do. I'm not, kind of like you when I mean, I'm in the crowd. I don't want to put my hand up. Because it could be a trick question or... Something like that. I know you guys are wise, and uh, I always teach people that: be careful what you're answering. I don't, I don't intentionally try to confuse people, but once in a while, things are we're flesh, right? But six ways to develop purity: um, living a life of integrity or developing purity. Number one, by keeping your promises, keeping your word. And this is all backed up by Scripture. Number one is uh, like keeping your word is so important. Saying. You know, and as I say all these things, if I, as I talk about all these things, there's going to be areas where you have failed. Because as I was preparing this, I'm looking, oh man, Lord, I'm, I'm preparing, I'm preaching, I'm going to be preaching this, but I've failed at every one of these areas. But that's the thing about the kingdom of God and the mercifulness of God. That he's merciful. And he says, you know, as long as we learn along the way. But keeping our promises is so much, so important. A person who promises a gift, and it's in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 14, says, a person who promises a gift but doesn't give it is like clouds and wind that bring no rain. Wow. That's like that really. What, and... Broken, we've all had broken promises to our, God, to our God, to our spouses, and to our children. I was listening to Rick Warren speak, and he had a, he had a son. He passed away, but he had a son who struggled with mental illness. 
all his life. And uh, Pastor Rick wanted him to go to uh, this Bible camp. He says, I want you to go to this, this Bible camp. It'd be really good for you. And he says, no, I don't want to go. So Pastor Rick says, well, I'll be your pastor. I'll, I'll be your counselor. I'll go with you. I'll, I'll look after your group and I'll be there for you. And you won't have to worry about being alone or anything. And the son says, no, I, I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to go. I don't care if you go or not. I don't want to go. And so Pastor Rick, he says, well, okay. And so he, and in the process of time, before, just before the camp started, about a week before the camp started, the son says, Dad, I want to go. You promised you'd take me. And he goes, oh, man. He says, but that was like three or four weeks ago. And in the meantime, promise keepers had called him, and he was to speak in front of 100,000 people. Like, <laughs> he was like, oh, what do I do? And he says, I phoned promise keepers, and I said, I couldn't make it. Sorry, I had a promise to my son, and I have to keep it. Like, wow, that's like a big decision right there. And and it's huge. And, and so I thought, man, oh, man. And I started thinking about this thing. And number two, um, the s- second way to, to live a life of purity, to be in the purity process is to, um, by paying my bills. Financial integrity is really amazing. Psalm chapter 3. 37 verse 21 says the wicked borrow and never repay but the godly are generous givers and so understand this there's things that happen in life and there's mistakes that happen all kinds of stuff like that but on the road to purity this is what we're going to be learning this is what we're going to be learning this is what you're going to find out this is life paying our bills and and paying our taxes and Romans chapter 13, verse 6 and 7 says, Pay your taxes too for these same reasons, for the government workers need to be paid. They are serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to collect to those who collect them and give respect and honor those who are all in authority. There's an, it's the process. I remember several, several years ago, there was an organization traveling around trying to prove that paying taxes was unconstitutional and they were fighting it and they were holding back their taxes and they weren't paying their taxes and several of them are in jail right now and they were trying to convince me you don't have to pay your taxes it's unconstitutional I said I got to pay my taxes because I don't want to go to jail (laughs) And they said, you'll never go. This is, we're going to prove it. We're going to prove it for sure. And these, some of these guys I knew really well. I said, I'm not doing it. When you find out and you, it's in court and it says that, it comes on the news and says, paying taxes is unconstitutional. I'm paying my taxes. Because the word of God says to, right there. It's, it's, this is all, you know. Um, people say, well, the government wastes all their money. Well, I know that, but... <laughs> <laughs> just let them be judged for what they got to do, right? And they don't waste it all. You know, we live in, we're, I'm so happy we live in Canada. Like, I'm glad we can pay taxes. I, I love it. I love living in our nation. I, 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 I could go live in countries where they don't pay taxes, but I won't have no food. I won't have a roof over my head. I won't have a vehicle. And I might probably be walking around bare feet. So I'd sooner pay taxes. Okay? So... This is just part of the reality of this road to purity. You know, and if you're getting uncomfortable with me right now, that's okay. I'm, I'm just preaching out of the word of God. And if you can bring it up to God, I'm, I'm not going to sit and argue with you. But look at the scripture and this is what we need to do. Number three, living a life of integrity or developing um, purity. Refuse to gossip. <laughs> yeah, this is a rough one. How many say amen to that? That's a rough one. Every one of us has got... Listen to this, though, in the message. In Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 3, it says, A gad about gossip can't be trusted with a secret, but someone of integrity won't violate confidence. So I thought to myself, what does gad about mean? (laughs) 
<laughs> Anybody ever heard that word before? I didn't. And, uh, but I, I looked it up, and gadabout is a, is a hab habitual pleasure seeker. And they're, they're a person who moves around restlessly or aimlessly from one social event to another to collect gossip. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So that's why I don't go to the coffee shop very much. <laughs> I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, you know. But this, again, is a very big part of integrity, especially if you're meeting with a group of people and um, you, you're, you're developing in the things of God. And, you know, all of us have problems. And when you get together with individuals and they're struggling in life, it's so important to keep, you know, to keep that to our, keep it within the group, you know, until the person's ready to... Um, testify about the deliverance of that problem um, Proverbs chapter 10 verse 18 says uh, one who conceals hatred has lying lips and whoever spreads slander is a fool so that's number three <laughs> I won't talk about that no more number four by um, living a life of integrity or developing purity um, this one might get some people upset but it's okay because it's the, it's the reality of the word of God by faithfully tithing that's how you learn to build integrity um, this is a test of integrity it's do I trust the Lord with my finances and and whatever I put my finances to first is what I trust the most and what is the most important to me and and so that's really a, an important issue. And the Bible says wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In uh, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 11, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what ways have, you rob have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this. He says, basically saying, test me in this. Do this, test me in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for, for you such a blessing that there will not be enough room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for your, you in your field, says the Lord of hosts. We rob God of the ability of him to bless us. We rob God also of the ability to rebuke the devourer for our sake. You see, it's so important even, we think of money, we're tithing money to protect our money, but it's not. It's really protecting our life. It's protecting our relationship because if we're tithing to God, he says that he will rebuke the devourer for our sake so that the devourer come, can't come and steal from us. Lots of times we get into the wrong relationship because of this right here. People say, well, what's relationship got to do with this? What's got everything to do with this? If you get into the wrong relationship, it's going to cost you a lot financially down the road. And it's, it's just one of those things that you're even the integrity of your business. Everything that you do is all be, begins protected. It's not just your finance that God protects you. It's like he protects you from the devourer, from slipping into the wrong relationship, getting into the wrong relationship with, with, with whoever, because it can be very costly if you get into the wrong relationship. You get into the wrong relationship with in business. It can be very costly and very quickly you can lose a lot. So tithing is very important in building integrity. Say amen if you believe that. Number five. This is an amazing one. This is so simple. This will change your life if you have work problems. Number five, living a life of integrity or developing purity by doing and being your best at work. That's working hard when nobody else is looking. You're being your best, the best that you can possibly be. If they're, whether the supervisor's around, whoever's around, it's the, you're doing the best job that you can because you're doing it for, 
for God, not for man. And I like this one. This is really good. Um, Colossians chapter 2, or 3, verse 23, it says, Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. It's good. Look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9 in the message. It says, Slack habits and sloppy work are as bad as vandalism. I told my brother to put this up in the shop, his shop. This is really good. Here, put it right up in front of everybody. Like, because people have a habit of when the boss isn't around, like, put this up, like, put big black letters, big on a four by eight sheet of plywood in your workplace. Sloppy hab sloppy ha slack habits and sloppy work are as bad as vandalism. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9 says, He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Oh, that's powerful. If you imagine if everybody said, I want to connect with God, what do I got to do? Well, this is one of the things you got to do. And everybody put it up in their workplace, all over the place. Kelly, you going to do that? Put it on your trailer. You're tra everywhere your trailer goes. You guys turn around, you know, let's be slack today. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> let's don't, let's don't. Let's just forget about that statement right there. We want to give a good day's work today. We want to because the Lord is watching. I guarantee you it would change things. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6 in the Living Translation says, Try to please them at all times, not just when they are watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Colossians chapter, did I do this one? Three? That one? 22? Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do. Try to please them at all time, not just when they are watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. I got an idea. What if every Christian... There's 2.3 billion of us in the world worked as hard as they could every day for their employers or their, their business, whatever it is. Wow. So that's good. Amen. I'm just reading scripture, guys. I'm not, I'm not coming up with any ideas here on my own. And This is stuff that's in the word of God. It's not just, you know, this fluffy stuff. The word of God's like challenging. Every day I read the Word of God, I go, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I need to change that area in my life. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, that's why the Word of God is so good. It keeps you straight. It, it, it purifies your heart. You know, and we, we say we want to have God. Well, we want to have God in every area of our lives. Well, this is what it's all about. This is what we're talking about here today as I read the notes from my Blackberry. Number six. Developing life of purity by being real with others. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse one and two says, "Since God has so generously let us in on what He is doing, we're not about to throw up our hands and walk off the job just because we run into occasional hard times. We refuse to wear masks and play games. We don't maneuver and manipulate behind the scenes, and we don't twist God's word to suit ourselves. Rather, we keep." Everything we do and say out in the open, the whole truth is on display so that those who want to, to can see and judge for themselves in the presence of God. How can a young person stay pure? In Psalm 119, verse 9 says, by obeying your word. That's it. And all I read today was the scripture. I'm not writing, these aren't ideas that I've conceived these are scriptures about developing purity and it's a process every one of us is in process not not every one of us is pure in any area of our lives a hundred percent pure but we're in process how to keep real care more about god's approval than man's approval number one number two stay in the word without the word we can never be pure and the reason that we need a Savior is because without Him we can do nothing. None of this is possible without Him. And this message was tough. It's a tough one. It was tough to prepare. It was probably tough to listen to.
But Saint Augustine said this, the confession of bad works is the beginning of good works. Let me say that one more time. The confession of bad works is the beginning of good works. The first step to purity or integrity is to confess that I haven't been pure. I haven't been honest. I have I've gossiped. I have not tired all the time. I all this stuff is the beginning. And the word says, be sure of this that one day your sins are going to find you out. And you might be thinking, it's none of my business how you're living. Well, it actually is. Because we're all in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. We're all interconnected. And God's desire for us is to live a life of purity, of peace, of integrity. And if you come into a boat with me and you're carrying a cordless drill with a two-inch hole saw in it, and you start drilling a hole in my boat, <laughs> I'm going to be concerned right away. <laughs> I'm going to say, hand the drill over. <laughs> and as Christians, we're, 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 don't, we're not like threatening people, but we're saying, guys, listen, we've got to get this together. We've got to get it right. If we get it right, the world will be attracted to what we have. You know why the world will be attracted to what we have? Because the presence of God will be with us. So there's eight attitudes that draw the presence of God. and One of them is a pure heart. And people recognize the pure heart. Even if it's not perfect, they'll recognize that it's trying. Like King David was a, was a man, God called him after his own, a man after his own heart. is because the direction of his heart was right. Not that everything he did was right which he weren't, but the direction of his heart was right. He was honest, saying, man, oh man, you know. And he'd talk about where he confessed his sins to the Lord. And you go into the Psalms and he struggled. He was a man that had great struggles in life. But his, he, his heart was in such the right, a right direction, even with all the mistakes that he did in his life. His heart was in such a, a, a proper direction that the Lord recognized him and named his son, Jesus Christ, as the, the son of David. Like, so the Lord, the Lord recognizes that direction of the heart. So when I, when I was pre preparing all this stuff, I, don't, I look at like the, the gossip thing and even the work thing and, and all this other stuff that we talked about, these, these six things that getting a pure heart I'm going man I I don't do all this stuff but I want to I don't do it but I want I don't do it all the time but I want to is there anybody else in the house like that that wants that and we need to have a heart that is drawn to the things of God instead of running and pulling away when it gets a little hot you know, a man, a man, like I've been under such great conviction sometimes. And the thing always is, I want to run. <laughs> I want to run for cover. I want to run. I want to hide. I don't want to live like this anymore. You know, I just want to go. I want to, but the Lord is saying, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of res restoration. Today is the beginning of the process of starting over. Let's stand to our feet. Jada, can you just come up? Thank you, Jesus. It's amazing how this all works. You know, I knew this is going to be a tough one to preach, but I didn't expect half of my equipment to break down. Thank you, Jesus. So right now, whatever you're thinking about, Whatever it might be. Maybe you've been struggling with keeping promises and paying bills and gossiping and the tithing thing. Doing our best at work. All those things. Maybe everything hits you at once today. The good news is that 
the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that first step, as St. Augustine says, the confession of bad works is the beginning of good works. There's that first step of doing that today. It's important to confess it, but it's more important to follow up with what we're confessing. Be repenting of, and in our hearts right now, repenting of, of the things and and but to keep the repentant heart when we walk out this door. So Jada's gonna sing a song and you can we can sing together with her. But it, if you've been struggling with any of these things that we talked about here today, and I think in reality it would be every one of us in some form or another. If we're harboring unforgiveness towards somebody that will keep you from getting a heart of purity so today I just want us to take a few moments and start this process over again say today I want you to repeat this today I'm starting over I'm beginning a new day down the trail to developing purity in Jesus' name, amen. So as we're singing this song, I, I don't know, I haven't done this for a while, but if, if you've been struggling with, I talked about a whole bunch of issues today, so nobody's going to know what you're struggling with. So when you, why don't you just come up and give that to God? You don't have to tell me nothing. Make that step. Make a physical step towards God and beginning to deal with this. Removing impurity to become pure. I want, us, I want us to come forward and deal with that as a body. If you're struggling in area, just come. and Jada, just lead us in this song. And as, as Jada's leading, you deal with what you deal with. Bring it to God. If you want to confess it to somebody, that's good too. Let's just, let's just do it for a moment. Just As Jada sings, just talk, find your place with God right now. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God, and I'm no longer a slave to fear, and I am a child of God. Just in a, we're going to pray together here in a second, and then once we pray, we're going to sing this song together, and we're going to mean it, right? Because like I said before, just pull the piano down just a bit, Josh. As I said before, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. There's nothing that cannot be forgiven. And the forgiveness is instant. 
bang. Say bang. As, 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 as quick as you say that, it's gone. Amen? The blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. And if you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to do so today, I'm going to lead us all in a prayer. And we're all going to say it for the sake of the ones that haven't. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for speaking to my heart and changing my life. I come to you today and confess my sins. I receive your forgiveness and I am yours and you are mine. For now and forever. Come cleanse me and wash away my sin. I desire to live a life of purity and with your help I can do it. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's sing that song together now. This is what you are. This is what we are. If you, if you said that prayer and you've come clean today with God and and you were a child of God before, but now the realization of it's going to become stronger to you. So let's sing this together. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. And I am a child of God. And I'm no longer. I am a child of God. And you split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescue me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescue me so I could stand. I am a child of God, and I am a child of God. Oh, yes, I am, and I am a child of God, and I am a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, I pray that that forever is etched in our hearts. The reality that we are a child, and you've made it, a, you made it that way, so that we could be your children. You brought us into the kingdom by grace and mercy. Now, grace and mercy will abound in your lives every single day. You just have to recognize it. Amen? Today, you don't walk out of this place feeling like you're guilty or all that stuff that Jesus came and he removed our guilt and he removed our shame. That was part of the work of the cross. It was not only that he forgave our sin, but he removed our guilt and our shame. Amen? So just in Jesus' name, be blessed this week. See you tonight.